The annual South by Southwest Pitch Competition Awards were announced last night, and Jake Cacciapaglia from Nebula Genomics won the competition with his company and a $5,000 prize in the blockchain technology category, as well as the best in show overall winner. Wow. Nebula Genomics is a blockchain-based startup founded by world-renowned Harvard geneticist George Church. The guy's a rock star. It's unique because the assets of the company that will be managed and exchanged using digital currency, get this, are your DNA. Your DNA. The company will use blockchain to not only allow individuals to share their personal genome for research purposes, but retain ownership and monetize their DNA through the trading of a custom digital currency which eliminates the middleman. Please welcome Jake Cacciapaglia. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you very, very much. It's exciting to be here. Yeah, congrats. congrats so first, I just have to say that I didn't pitch. Our co-founder, Dennis, our CSO, pitched, and he did a great job. He crushed it. I just get to stand in and take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, and you're in business development, so you're going to be an excellent explainer for I hope this. so. Um, can you please set the stage for uh, the people viewing right now and talk a little bit about uh, this world that we're entering into with genome sequencing, editing, and coding? Sure. So we believe that uh, your genetic data is the most important data about you. And uh, there's uh, a huge number of people who have already taken in-home genetic testing. 26 million people is the latest figure. Myself and included. Great. We, we, we appreciate everyone that's done it so far. But that's not nearly enough for the research that needs to be done. And there are some signs of slowing due to privacy concerns with the current market and things that are happening. And, and there are kind of like three main factors for, that are contributing to the slowdown of or concerns around privacy. So uh, companies selling genetic data, uh, governments using data, you know, for various reasons, subpoena, subpoenaing some of these companies for the data for solving certain like crimes and cases. And then governments using data potentially to discri discriminate or insurance companies to discriminate uh, against you for you know, health purposes and, and, and things like that. So there are a variety of reasons. They're all valid concerns. Uh, but truly, to make the breakthroughs that are possible with genomic data, we need people to be sharing that data, um, and that, that that will eventually lead to saving lives. Mm -hmm. And so, when it comes to uh, what you guys do, yeah. how how are you innovating on all of this? So, I, I mean, the, the the main differentiation is that we are we're putting privacy from a technology standpoint. We're putting privacy at the forefront. So, building trust with consumers by really taking the steps to make sure our technology is, is truly protecting you and giving you full control and ownership of your genetic data. Uh, do you mind uh, taking us a step back for those uh, uh, who are watching who maybe don't understand sure. some of the privacy benefits of blockchain? Sure. So I'll just I'll break it into kind of three main properties uh, that make blockchain kind of a unique for, for certain use cases. I think the blockchain is being applied and you know if you say it was funny someone said on stage yesterday if you say blockchain three times you'll automatically get an investment <laughs> but which is you know it 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 um it, it does for specific use cases uh make a lot of sense and for us we believe that the use case makes sense so the three main properties that that we find uh most beneficial are one that so blockchain is a, a database uh, but its its unique quality is that it's distributed, and that means that um, there are s multiple entities that manage the the database and basically um, uh, you know oversee what's happening and um, that, that, so the first property is that, that it's distributed and that there are multiple entities looking over the, the database. The second property is that it's um, it's driven off of transparency, and so what that means is that um, when you know when something gets added to the database, what what happens is those multiple entities have to agree that whatever's being entered into the database um, is basically there's consensus that that thing has been added, and then so that's the second property that it's that it's. Um, uh, that it that is driven off con consensus and transparency. So uh, that's the second property. The third property is that 
um, it's immutable. So the things that are added to the database can't be changed. Right. So you have basically those three things that, that set it up as like a really unique situation where you have uh, multiple entities kind of overseeing. You have this idea of consensus. Everyone that, that oversees the database basically agrees what gets added and then that nothing can be changed about the database once it's been added. Mm -hmm. And those mul just to be clear, those multiple entities are you and me and, and other individuals, not necessarily just like one group, like a bank or a... a you know. It can be a variety of things. Company. It can be um, nonprofit organizations, academia. It can be, I mean, like there really can be multiple entities and, and uh, we want more, you know, you want more more entities than, than less. So, right, because um, you have to compromise all of them in order to actually that's like, right. affect yeah. the and, data. And, and I should mention that uh, if you have entities in multiple or in different jurisdictions, that's also really interesting. So in our case, if you know um, a national government wants to get access to genetic data and there are regulations on, a, on like a, a, a national level uh, and your database is across multiple jurisdictions, it's hard to get access to that data because really like the, the there's just not there's not a way to do so. It's hard to do so. Can you walk me through uh, some some of the practical applications and practical benefits of having this information in your technology? Yeah. So I think the 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 very ma so the main reason that you would get genetic testing done by us is if you have concerns about what happens. So we know that uh, you know a large percentage of people who have seen ads for other genetic testing, so 40, 45% of people who, have, who are considering genetic testing haven't done so because they have concerns about what might happen with their data. So we know this is a concern for a lot of people. Um, so what, so the, main, the main thing that we offer is whole genome sequencing. Uh, and right now we're doing this thing called low-pass sequencing that basically gives you some uh, information about your inherited traits, your ancestry, um, and then you know genomic discoveries that are happening around you or specific to you. So that's sort of practically what you get as a, a consumer of our low-pass whole genome sequencing. Uh, and it's no, it should be noted that that's whole genome sequencing is different than genotyping, which is done by a lot of the other competitors mm -hmm. in the space. Um, th there's uh, you know. I'm not going to go into the depth. It's okay. Of it's that, okay. But, uh, <laughs> so I think so. The, number one, as a consumer of our product, you get the genetic testing and some of these reports, and then also the ability to control who, on the research side of things, gets access to your data. So you have full control. We, as a company, don't even have control of okay. your data. Uh, we don't have the keys to your data unless you give us uh, access. So you have control to say, okay, um, pharma company X wants to. Uh, do this study, they, they found that you're an interesting possible participant based on some of the maybe surveys that you've asked or answered, sorry, and then they will put a request out to um, a population of people that they think match the study that they want to do. You get a message on our, our platform and you mm. get to decide, yes, that's something I want to participate or I don't want to participate in. We don't actually do any of that. You right. do it directly. So there's a direct engagement between the consumer and the research that's being done. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned earlier at the top of this conversation um, that it, it, this gets this technology gets better and better the more people who submit uh, their DNA. Uh, what are what, and specifically, the, uh, what can we do to benefit uh, the, our population with more and more people? Can you g give me some, give me some examples? Like, cause I still feel like it's a little bit abstract to a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for for so we talk about like machine learning and, and AI a lot about how these technologies exist, but they need huge populations of data to uh, actually do the work that they need to do. So when we say like, okay, uh, you have a very specific variant in your, your genome that is causing, for example, you to have certain symptoms. You don't, I mean, there's, there's uh, 7,000 rare diseases, uh, many, of, many of those people, so 30 million people in the United States, 350 million people around the world who have rare genetic diseases, or 80% of those rare diseases are genetic in nature, and there's, there's really little known about those diseases. Um, so how that, like, how that plays out is that these, these people with certain mutations or certain uh, uh, ch like changes that have happened to their DNA are, are basically left, basically trying to figure out for themselves. They're, they're physicians, they're specialists, don't have enough data, they don't have enough cases mm -hmm. to like know what's going on. So that variant that might be unique to you 
the more people that we have, a more, the, the larger the population we have, the better we can run sort of analysis and figure out, okay, so there are, you know, in our database, because we have millions of people, uh, we don't yet, but like when you have millions of people or hundreds of millions of people, it's, it's easier to find people that look like you and then look at the, the, not just the genetic data, but also the data that, you know, that you report. So here's my lifestyle information. Do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you... You know, are you physically regularly? active? Yes. Yeah, so all of those environmental factors are really important to this right. too. And once you have that data at, at, at a population level, it, you can start to actually say, okay, here's a genetic mutation or here's a change or a variant, and that matches someone over here and they have similar symptoms and they have similar lifestyles. Okay, we can actually like do some discovery. Uh -huh. So, so that's on the diagno diagnostic side. So well, that, that's a compelling reason to submit your your DNA and have we it sequenced. We think so. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so that that's like you know this kind of altruistic thing. You know, it's like being an organ donor or like you know basically saying the the best thing you can do. You yes, you can get reports that are good for you that like give you some insights. But really, the the the, the most beneficial thing you can do is contribute your DNA for research because it's going to help. Uh, these breakthroughs happen faster. Mm -hmm. And I should reiterate that on your website it, it says that you uh, give the control of the data to the submitter, to the, to the individual. That's right, full control. And, and why to you and why, to the, comp and why to, uh, to the company is that important? I mean, it, it, it's for, because it's, it's this, in, this information is the most unique or most important data about you. And in general, uh, this isn't something that some other organization should own. We believe that, like through and through, and uh, like for for those breakthroughs to happen, there needs to be an enormous amount of trust that happens. So the only way for people to trust that that someone else isn't going to do something bad with your data is that if you own it yourself. So that that's I think that's the you know the the most compelling thing that I could say is that. Uh, you should own your, your genetic data and no one else should. Mm -hmm. we, we mentioned earlier about uh, individuals all having access and um, you would have to compromise everyone in order to, to hack this, but um, to hack your information. But I am curious to know what are the inherent risks? Like what is the likelihood, the possibility of having something like this hacked in so, theory? So I think there are kind of two separate things here and, and I am not our you know, technical lead on cryptography um, and so I think there are two very different things we're talking about um, control and ownership of data and we're talking about like hacking hacking is always possible so the more like um, you know we, we're blockchain doesn't solve hacking blockchain gives you full control and ownership consent uh, ownership so the ability to say I want to share my data or not and and that like this company is not going to do something with my data that I don't want them to. An outside sort of uh, threat is it, there's you know one set of our technology is blockchain, the other set of our technology is around cryptography and using sort of the best practices around building a, a secured data or secured data structure and computational structure for researchers, mm -hmm. um, which I can't explain in detail, but That's okay. uh, the um, but the team is, is you know it's important to note that there are multiple sets of technology that are being used. It's not just that blockchain is going to save the world and like protect everyone from hacking, because <laughs> sure. that's definitely not true. Sure. Uh, and, and I think there's sort of a, a little bit of a misunderstanding about that specifically. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, we, we only have a, a little bit of time left, but uh, I, don't, I don't want people to forget <laughs> that your company won the South by Southwest pitch competition. And, and I was curious to know like, what it was like for you to be a part of that. And sure. Um, so like I said, uh, our co-founder Dennis was the one that kind of went through the process uh, end to end. So I was definitely a bystander, and I was with him through the process, uh, you know, refining the pitch. But there was there was a it was a months long process. There were many sort of steps along the way from um, you know entering the competition and getting kind of whittled down to the finalists. Once the finalists were selected, uh, it was about two months out, I think, and there was a coach assigned for the pitch pre for the pitch um, contest. I think each team got to work with a coach throughout that process, and that was really helpful. There were like several rounds of you know phone calls and and uh, pr pretty like significant feedback on on the pitches to refine it and. I will say that I listened to Dennis give the pitch, you know, probably 50 or 100 sure. times just to, to get it down. Two minutes is a really short amount of time to distill <laughs> everything know. that well, you're you've doing. you've just been talking yeah. about, yeah. So, 
it, it's really hard. And then there were, so, I mean, it was amazing. The the teams, I'm kind of deviating, but the teams that were there that did the one minute pitches, were, every team was yeah. really high quality Incredible, in the competition. Yeah. So uh, I just have to say that, yeah, yeah, it was really, really impressive, the quality of the companies and the diversity of like the backgrounds, people from all over the world that were there. And mm -hmm. I will say that's like the number one thing about South by Southwest that's different, I think, this year than past years is one, the number of people from different countries, so the international footprint. Um, I haven't been here since five years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but that's one thing that I noticed, and then just Austin's kind of exploding, so. All yeah. right, well, Jake, that was a perfect way to end it. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, come back sometime soon. Yeah, I hope um, to. want to hear more about the company, <laughs> and I want to thank uh, you for out there for watching, and I want to let you know about the great lineup of guests that we have in the live studio today. At noon today, we'll be talking with food journalist and author Mark Bittman, Bark, excuse me, Mark Bittman, who will be joined by award-winning chef Dominique Crenn, it's amazing. At 1.40, basketball legend Chris Bosch will be here in the house, super excited about that. And at 3 p.m., Michael Pollan and Tim Ferriss will be dropping by in the studio for what I'm sure will be a very enlightening conversation on, get this, psychedelics. So please stay tuned for more at South by Southwest Live.